So um, I'd first like to um, welcome you all to the UAB Department of Pathology Grand Rounds. Um, I know several of our department are at USCAP this week, so it's great to still see so many of you already logged in and still logging in. And before I introduce today's speaker, um, I do want to give you some good news. Um, please be on the lookout for an email from Lara highlighting some exciting changes for the fall grand rounds, namely which we will be resuming to a hybrid model. Um, that being said, please send Lara your nominations for both internal and then especially external speakers that you'd actually like to get on campus. So that being said and behind us today, it's also my pleasure to introduce um, UAB's very own Dr. Erin Buchek. Dr. Buchek earned her uh, BS from the University of Rochester before completing her medical degree at Duke University. She then came to UAB completing both her residency and subsequent fellowship. And she liked it here so much um, that she joined us as faculty in 2017 as an assistant professor of surgery in the department of otolaryngology. Um, since that time, Dr. Buchek has also taken on roles as the director of the student clerkships, as well as that of endocrine surgery for her department. She's active in several national societies and committees, including being the co-founder for the Women in um, Otolaryngology Council here at UAB. She's contributed to 18 publications, one of which already published this year, as well as several book chapters and various meeting contributions. Um, Dr. Buchek's research interests are in um, clinical outcomes related to endocrine surgery, as well as head and neck cancer surgical outcomes. In addition to this, she is also interested in novel postoperative pain management and improving quality of life for these cancer patients. Um, today, she's going to tell us a little bit more about that first interest as she talks to us about head and neck cancer, surgical pathology, and implications for treatment. Thank you, Dr. Buchek. The floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. Before we get started, um, I wanted to just say there should be plenty of time at the end for questions, but also feel free to, to raise your hand or interrupt. I'm going to try to keep an eye on um, uh, the chat box as much as I can, but um, again, feel free to just unmute if you have any burning questions. So with that being said, uh, I don't particularly have any disclosures uh, related to this talk, other than the fact that I am just a simple surgeon and talking to pathologists, I'm gonna talk about pathology, which in hindsight might be a bad idea. So just bear with me and forgive any, any transgressions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, my, what our goals were um, creating this Grand Rounds talk. And I say our, because uh, as I'll see in a slide or so, the topic that I'm going to talk to you about really was born out of a, a very real need and, and um, some, I wouldn't say concerns, but uh, uh, some thoughts that our surgical division had, as well as some folks in the oral surgery division. And we had a really fantastic meeting about a couple of weeks ago with uh, Dr. Laura uh, Gonzalez and, and um, some other members of the pathology department. And that out of that meeting came this, this talk. And so that's what helped frame it. So one of the objectives I want to cover is just to review a little bit about oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, the incidence of it, and some of the challenges in treating that area. Also review the updated staging guidelines and some relevant pathologic information, and then discuss in more detail the variety of pathologic margin sampling methods, because that's really become a hot topic lately from a surgical standpoint. And I wanted to review some of the literature and data around that. So just for some context, I thought it might be nice for you guys to see some, some pictures on who's on the other end of the phone when you're calling a frozen section in or who we are. So this is the uh, division of head and neck surgery within the Department of Otolaryngology. These are my partners. There's me, Dr. J. Rajan, our division director, Dr. McCammon, Dr. Green, and then Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas mainly does just reconstruction, but she's also involved with a lot of our uh, head and neck cancer surgeries. And then we also um, are very uh, collaborative and love working with the oral maxillofacial um, department as well. And within their department, they have two head and neck surgeons, Dr. Tony Moreland and Dr. Yidi Yang, who you've probably seen a lot of their stuff around because they primarily do oral cavity cancer. So we wanted to focus on, on oral cavity in particular, uh, as opposed to just all head and neck cancer because of the complexity in dealing with oral cavity as well as some of the controversies associated with the pathology around it. Um, so that's why we, I chose to focus on this subsite. 
Uh, overall though, oral cavity cancer develops in about 10.5 adults per 100,000 and about uh, roughly 50,000 Americans will be diagnosed with oral cavity cancer every year. Risk factors are traditionally tobacco abuse and that can be in the form of cigarette smoking, uh, snuff, dip, cigars, you name it, anything you basically put in your mouth. Betel nut use, which we don't see a lot of in the US, but is a huge risk factor in um, India and the rest of Southeast Asia. And alcohol abuse is usually considered a adjunct um, risk factor as well. Just to review a little bit of anatomy about what we're talking about. Um, this is the oral cavity as a whole, but within the oral cavity, there are subsites that we consider very differently and diseases or cancers that arise in these different areas tend to behave differently as well. So we have the lip area on the outside. Traditionally, we consider the, the oral cavity portion of the lip is the entire red lip. But beyond that would be actually more of a cutaneous skin cancer. You have your traditional tongue cancer, which is the most common, floor of mouth cancer, gingival cancer, and then the buccal mucosa, retromolar trigone, and lastly, we have the hard palate. For all comers, um, this is some data looking at the SEER database uh, with regards to outcomes for oral cavity cancer, broken down by all comers and then uh, broken out by race as well. You can see that for localized disease, so contained just to the oral cavity, the survival rate is about 82.8% at five years clearly gets a lot worse as your disease progresses. Regional disease only has about a 50% survival rate at five years, and distant disease is only 27.8. And also to highlight, there is some serious um, discrepancies in survival with regards to race as well. So here are some just uh, bread and butter pictures of uh, oral cavity cancer. You can see here a very exophytic lateral tongue lesion um, and here is an alveolar ridge buccal mucosal lesion as well. Uh, we, the treatments for these is what we're gonna delve into next and talk about a little bit the surgical management first. So what are our goals when we talk about oral cavity cancer treatment? Seems obvious, but our first goal is of course, complete resection of the primary tumor while maintaining as much function as possible. There's, there's certain things that we control as a surgeon. One of them is adequate margins. Uh, and there are certain things that we can't control. For instance, tumor biology, um, and, and that is worse. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, disease um, uh, interval, and then depth of invasion, tumor site. Uh, other goals here are treating both the involved and at-risk lymph node basins. Typically for oral cavity cancer, that's going to be lymph node levels one through three in the neck, which is basically the top part of the neck, mainly around the submandibular glands and then slightly lower down into the lateral neck area. And then finally, we want to provide appropriate reconstruction to optimize post-operative function and quality of life. And the first two, the first and third goal here, goals here are really interrelated uh, quite a bit because obviously the more tissue that we have to resect, the more complicated of a reconstruction that we might need to perform. And when we consider reconstruction, we consider really three aspects, which this applies to most head and neck cancer, but particularly for oral cavity, we're looking at speech, swallowing, and breathing. And for us, we want to, our goals are to allow the patient to be intelligible, um, ideally in everyday conversation and on the phone, but at least to be understandable in person is really critical for quality of life. For swallowing, our goals are to be able to tolerate at least some portion of a PO diet. Ideally, we would like them to be completely PEG independent. And then lastly, breathing, we would ideally like to make sure our patients don't need a trach long-term, although most of them, if they require a big resection, will end up with a trach at least temporarily. So these are what we, when I counsel patient in clinic, these are the, the aspects that we're talking about when we discuss what are our goals with surgery and what are our expected outcomes. So the first line therapy for oral cavity cancer is of course surgery, but it is often followed by adjuvant radiation, sometimes adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation, and uh, we'll touch on that a bit later in the talk, what the indications are for radiation and chemotherapy. And then most importantly, this is a really high stakes area with regards to function. What I mean by that is 
you can see this is a what appears to be a relatively small oral cavity cancer, but due to the nature of the disease, we have to be fairly aggressive with surgery and leads to quite a sizable defect once we completely resect the lesion. And millimeters really matter in this area because the tongue is such a complicated structure uh, as well as the entire oral cavity that even taking a little bit more can greatly impact those three functions that I just mentioned. And particularly for the tongue, it's speech that we worry about the most. So we discussed a little bit earlier about, we talked about resection, let's chat a little bit about reconstruction. So uh, as surgeons, we always like to talk about the reconstructive ladder, the higher up on the ladder that you go, this usually means a longer and more complex operation and the recovery time is a lot longer as well. Additionally, it usually impacts function more and more the, the more complicated of a reconstruction that you get, although we do try to balance complexity of surgery with functional outcomes. And sometimes it's better to do a more complicated operation on the front end to have a better long-term outcome. So it really depends on the extensive tissue that is extirpated. So whether that is soft tissue versus composite resection, meaning if we're taking out just soft tissue, ideally we just wanna reconstruct with soft tissue alone. But if you remove bone and in oral cavity case, that would be either maxilla or mandible, we're trying to reconstruct that area with similar tissue. So that ups the ante a lot on the, the level and complexity of reconstruction that is needed. It also limits your, your reconstructive options as far as where we can get tissue from. Um, we are very much consider tissue bulk for function. So in the mouth, what that means is basically the more bulk that the tongue has, typically the better speech outcomes and the better swallowing outcomes that you'll get. You may take a bit of a hit on a breathing standpoint, but those are some of the pros and cons that we weigh when we think about what options we have for reconstruction. And then the other issue is oftentimes with these big surgeries, we'll get a communication with the neck because as I said earlier, we're also treating the neck at the same time. So one of the reconstructive goals is creating a safe wound as well. And that's to prevent saliva from running into the neck, which obviously can cause significant tissue damage, infection, carotid blowouts, that kind of thing. So we're very um, aware of this, that if we do have a communication in the neck, that's going to require a far more complicated reconstruction than if you can keep the two areas separate. So what are our options in the oral cavity? Uh, ideally for smaller tumors like T1, T2 um, oral cavity cancers, we're looking to try to close things primarily if we can, or even by secondary intention. Um, and sometimes you do kind of a combination of both. I'll say primary closure is ideal from a pain standpoint. Um, because healing by secondary intention does hurt quite a bit, but a lot of times you don't want to tie things down too tightly or tether the tongue, which can lead to um, impediments in the speech later down the line. Skin grafts are also an option, particularly in the floor of mouth area, to just reline things and prevent scar contraction. And then lastly, we can use free flaps, whether that be bony free flaps, which include fibula or scapula flaps, versus purely soft tissue, which we typically use either radial forearm free flaps or potentially an anterior lateral side flap. So we like to start here if we can, but as things progress, as the resection gets bigger and bigger, that's when we have to move up this reconstructive ladder. Here's some intraoperative photos of what that looks like. So this is a, obviously a lateral tongue cancer here, um, fairly posterior in the tongue. Those can be fairly challenging to get at. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the resection afterwards, but this is the free flap that we use to reconstruct it that is actually coming from the forearm. So this is forearm skin here, and this is the arterial and venous pedicle coming off that's supplying this um, forearm skin. We have to make a tunnel for this pedicle that goes down into the neck, and then we create an anastomosis in the neck to help keep this flap alive. And this is what it looks like actually inset into the oral cavity. You can see native tongue here. You can see the, the uh, forearm skin relining the um, lateral tongue and floor of mouth. And then this just for note is our is a dop off tube that helps with feeding afterwards because patients, we don't let them have anything by mouth for at least six to seven days. And then you can also see their trach off in the distance there. To further illustrate just our reconstructive progression, um, this is an example of a fairly small 
superficial lesion, T2, SCCA, the lateral tug. This is what things look like after the resection is out. And this is the kind of lesion that you can easily close on itself. And even if this completely popped open, all those stitches fell out for whatever reason, it would still heal very nicely. And patient has really good tongue projection. Um, so their speech and swallowing will be minimally impacted by that tumor. This is an example of a skin graft in the floor of mouth. Um, this tumor, I, I don't know the original size on this picture, but it was probably a T1, T2, because you can see that most of the ventral tongue is still preserved. Um, and the reason we like to put this skin graft in here is not because the wound wouldn't heal on its own, but the skin graft helps prevent contraction, which is very, very important in the anterior tongue, because if the wound contracts, then the entire tongue will be tethered, which really inhibits projection and ultimately speech. And then this is the final result of something similar to the last side where this is a free flap here that basically this is a, likely a hemiglossectomy and they've reconstructed the bulk of the tongue with this free flap. And the advantage here is that the native tongue then is more in its natural position and can move more freely. The downside is this piece of tissue is not functional. It doesn't move on its own. The only thing that it really does is provide bulk, which is still important but it will never function the same way as the original tongue. This is a paper that uh, I thought was really uh, interesting and beneficial from Jonathan Irish, who used to be the president of our American Head and Neck Society, um, looking specifically at speech outcomes after a partial glossectomy, mainly to look at how both patients and um, impartial listeners perceived speech. And so they did pre-surgical, uh, pre-resection speech uh, evaluation as well as post-op. And they found that about 63% of the variance between the two um, accounted for uh, their pre-surgical speech. So basically what were, how did they sound beforehand? A lot of that had to do with the tumor itself. But a significant portion of the variance had to do with the amount of tissue that was resected, which is of course also dependent on the tumor, um, but it was directly correlated with the amount of tissue. And then when they did an area under the curve analysis, it demonstrated that about 20.4% of surface area of the tongue was the kind of the, the cutoff point for what determined really poor, much poorer speech um, acceptability. So next I wanna just briefly recap um, some of the AJCC um, staging guidelines for oral cavity cancer. This is the seventh edition. So this is the not the most recent version, but the version before that. And this was, as I'm sure you all know, um, based mainly on size. And so T1, T2 was based on, on centimeter thickness and size of the tumor. As you got more advanced, it obviously uh, had more to do with invasion to the surrounding structures. Uh, for instance, oral cavity for the, the tongue, it would be invasion into the mandible or maxilla. Um, and then T4B of obviously the most advanced um, form of disease. And and we, we think we recognized for a while that this staging, while it was okay, sort of lacked some nuance as far as tumor biology and really characterizing some of these lesions uh, appropriately as far as aggressiveness. And so that's where the, the concept of depth, uh, depth of invasion came into play. And again, forgive me, y'all, I'm sure y'all most of you know this, but uh, depth of invasion does not measure the tumor thickness itself, but rather measures the amount that the tumor has invaded into the mucosa. And it's done by establishing this horizon line from the basement membrane and measuring down to where the tumor invades into the tissues. And so how does, how does depth of invasion impact the extent of surgery? So when we see a depth of invasion over three millimeters, and there is some debate about that number, but three millimeters and, and at most five millimeters um, really necessitates management of the neck. And what we mean by that is if you have a tumor that only has a depth of invasion of one or two millimeters, you can usually observe the neck or consider a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But if it's between three and five or greater than five, at that point, we're um, counseling the patient that even if they have no clinical evidence of nodal disease, that we're gonna be talking about a neck dissection uh, because of the uh, increased risk of occult metastasis. Um, and we feel like depth of invasion is a better gauge of aggressiveness besides size alone. And that was really incorporated into the eighth edition of the staging guidelines where not only do we look at size, but we're 
excuse me, also looking at depth of invasion. So the next portion of the talk, I wanted to discuss a little bit about specimen evaluation and margins. And I realize that this is a controversial and a difficult uh, topic to talk about, but uh, after that meeting that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I felt like this was really important for us to begin a conversation on. And it was helpful uh, to look through some of the data that um, exists out there and see what other centers are doing as well. So specimen evaluation. This specimen, I don't think is too hard to figure out exactly where it came from and what it's doing. This one's fairly straightforward, right? I mean, it's obvious this is floor of mouth, ventral tongue tumor. You can see teeth. You know this is lymph nodes. This isn't too challenging to figure out exactly what you're looking at, right? And this is where this is what it looks like coming out of the patient. So once it's out, this is what we're left looking at once we send the specimen down to you guys. This is a bit of a mess on the other hand. Um, but this one's a little bit easier to at least orient where you are. But what about those smaller lesions, ones that aren't quite as obvious and don't require a huge composite resection? Like, where is this coming from? Is this the lateral tongue, floor of mouth? What side is it coming from? You know, basically, what are we looking at? Uh, it can be really, really hard to tell and very disorienting. And so without having extremely good communication between surgeon and pathologist, it's, it's pretty hard to know what you're staring at. Um, I, I, I hate to say stole, but I, I borrowed uh, this form from one of my partners. Dr. Jayarajan made this when he was training in Australia. Um, and we've been trying to think of ways that we can communicate more effectively and better between us in the OR and you guys in pathology. And this is one of the forms that he had made. And I thought it was a, a great idea and something that we should talk about. And we have talked about um, but just to illustrate sort of this is what they would fill out for every single surgery, every resection. Um, and there's uh, really intricate diagrams, um, clinical staging, exactly what was done. Uh, and I think that this could potentially be really useful or something like this. And then this is what uh, some of the drawings and, and Dr. Laura had come up with something like this as well. I just didn't have access to his form that he made, but I wanted to illustrate that this I think would be really beneficial for us to exactly draw and clearly delineate exactly where the tumor was resected from. Because you can see we're in a really small space and there's a lot of very important stuff here so that we can circle and highlight and be very, very clear about where these tumor specimens are coming from. Um, and I wanted to give credit where credit was due. And I'm sure many of you know this name, uh, Dr. Brandywine Weber now, he used to be Brandywine Gensler, who's a professor at Mount Sinai, used to be here at UAB several years ago. Um, she gave a really great talk in conjunction with other surgeons at the multidisciplinary head and neck meeting back in February. And um, I watched that, that, that um, uh, presentation and it was extremely beneficial. And I wanted to include a lot of the concepts that she discussed. So, but I wanted to give her credit, of course, because I didn't make all of this up. <laughs> so first importantly, where, where are we getting margins? This is, this is where the controversy lies, I think. And um, one of the things that we've discussed a lot at that meeting. So traditionally here, we have been uh, obtaining what I call defect-based margins or margins based out of the uh, tumor bed. So not from the specimen itself. So what are some of the advantages of obtaining margins this way? One, it's a lot easier to process, or at least that's what I understand, which makes sense. You're just looking at little strips of either mucosa or muscle or deep tissue that are all separate. Um, and it doesn't require um, a, a intricate knowledge of exactly where the resection was. And it also doesn't require orientation in relationship to the tumor. What are some of the cons though of doing defect-based margins? One, identification of tumor cells can be challenging because it's completely separate from the tumor. Two, the distance from the actual tumor itself is, is really impossible to determine directly, and you're only really understanding if it's positive or negative. There can be electrocautery artifact, depending on how those margins were obtained. And, and in my mind, as the surgeon, this is the most uh, important one there's this concept of random sampling error. And what we mean by that is once the tumor is out, it can be hard for us to know exactly where these margins are in relationship to the tumor itself on the specimen. And you would think that if anyone were to know where it's coming from, it would be us because we just took it out. But everything can change. The oral cavity and mucosa can collapse a lot. 
So it can be actually a challenge to know exactly where you're getting those margins from. So what's the other way of taking margins? And that's called specimen-based margins. And so what that means, as you guys know, this is what you, typ you typically get on our um, permanent pathology, on our, our gross specimen. So being the pros are you're really able to determine a specific margin distance from the tumor. Um, that is very accurate. Um, and you can, if you're doing this in the frozen lab or you're doing it intraoperatively, you have the ability to ink the specimen at the time of tumor removal, right then and there in real time. What are some of the cons? Well, for starters, just from a practicality standpoint, it A, requires a really thorough and clear communication between surgeon and pathologist. And that's actually, that can be really hard to do in practicality, like how Right now, it, it um, involves us traveling to pathology, but beyond that, it takes a really long time to do this. And I think that is the, the, the probably biggest issue that I can see is that that's just a lot. That is a ton of work. It is really hard to do that quickly. Um, and we appreciate that. So this, that's, that's a big issue. Uh, and it needs a lot more um, from pathology, from pathology resources, who's in the frozen section room, who's processing this. So there's a, a lot of barrier to being able to do it in this way. But I wanted to review a little bit of the data about um, how the, the head of that community as a whole um, is doing this, how other institutions are doing it, and what some of the studies are looking at how margins are obtained, either from the tumor bed or from the specimen itself. And when I say, I don't mean necessarily permanent margins, but we're mainly talking about frozen section margins and how you are analyzing your, your margin status at the time of surgery. So this first study um, was published in 2015. It's a retrospective review looking at early oral cavity cancers, T1, T2, and they looked at about 280 patients. They broke down the, the different patient groups into three groups. Group one, um, they took all of the margins from the tumor itself like this is sort of this diagram. Hopefully you can see that where all the margins were taken right off of the specimen. Group two, they were taking, off, excuse me, they were taken off of the specimen, but there were positive margins on the original specimen. And the margins were then re-resected from the tumor bed if they were close or positive. And then group three, this uh, group margins were taken directly from the tumor bed itself. And you can see they have little color coded dots illustrating where that supposedly correlated on the tumor bed with on the specimen itself. And the status of the margins correlated with local recurrence. So the difference between um, local recurrence free survival at three years was similar between groups one and two, but was significantly lower um, for group three. Uh, and, and one of the things that was brought up in the, the presentation at the national meeting was the only really way to know between these two methods would be to do a prospective randomized control study. Unfortunately, only one of those that I could find has ever really been done. And this was done out of a group in Israel and they randomized patients to either having specimen-based margins versus patient-based margins. This would be the specimen arm and this would be the patient-based um, arm. And unfortunately, they actually had to stop the, uh, the patient-based arm because they were having high, close and positive margin rates. And so everybody ended up getting switched over to the second arm. But this is their data from that study. And you can see that this is the, the patient-driven analysis versus the specimen-driven analysis in this column. And, and this is their positive and close final margin status was significantly higher in the patient-driven versus the specimen-driven. And this is why they ultimately ended up um, canceling that arm of the study. This is for T1, T2 disease. And then when you look at T3, 4 disease, um, the difference is even worse. So the patient-driven analysis, they had 63% positive or close margin, um, which as we can all agree is really unacceptably high. So, you know, this, this sounds good, right? All this data sounds, sounds like, oh, this is, this is the way we should do it, right? Um, why are we even talking about this? But, but the practicality of the matter, which is a really important point, is how do we do this? How do we make this work? Um, and that's one of the big struggles that we, when we met, that's what we were talking about. Um, and, uh, excuse me. And so this is where I'm going to uh, borrow a little bit of uh, Dr. Um, Brandywine Gensler, Brandywine Weber, excuse me, uh, some, her, some of her slides and insights 
because up at Mount Sinai where she practices, this is how they, they do all of their intraoperative evaluations. And so it was really helpful, I think, to hear from her about, you know, this is kind of a, this is how I do it thing. So when she spoke, this is uh, literally one of her drawings intraoperatively for a small specimen, T1, T2. And see, I look at that and my eyes glaze over. I'm hopeful that you all look at that and have a much better idea of what she's drawing. Um, but she maps and numbers each of these tissue slices. The specimen is submitted for margin analysis, including distances, depth of invasion, and um, worst progression of disease of uh, invasion. And it takes it takes her about 30 minutes or longer to do that, which that, that seems like a reasonable amount of time um, as far as uh, processing. That's for T1, T2 cancer, though. What about a bigger specimen? You want to talk about getting confused. I looked at this and again, uh, I was like, I don't even know what I'm staring at. I don't know how she interprets that. This is a really large, complicated specimen. It's uh, mapped. She doesn't map out the entire thing, um, but she, she samples the areas of concern and she makes multiple perpendicular cuts and the closest margins are selected for histologic analysis. And so next I wanted to, um, I actually took a video of her talking at this conference and I thought it might be useful to show you all, you know, in real time, how does this look? What does this look like? How do they do this? Because to me, this seems really, really challenging. And I, as we were discussing it a couple of weeks ago, we didn't really know what this would practically look like. So I'm just gonna play this video. It's only a couple of minutes long, but I think it'd be valuable to, to hear it from the horse's mouth. So what we're doing here is prior to my dissecting out, mapping and dissecting out frozen sections, we're making 3D representations of the specimen. This is using 3D camera. Um, and then after this process is done, after the scanning is done, I then grab the specimen away, I give you that, and I start mapping it, inking it, cutting it, do everything that I do in order to do the margin assessment while this is being generated. Now, the, the numbers and the lines that you see here is me going back to the specimen to then show um, where I've looked and where I need to report. Now, obviously, I've cut into the specimen a lot more than this. I don't have to show every place that I make a cut, but I am trying to demonstrate every place where there's a relevant margin that I want to report. And this is the money shot. <laughs> Um, she eloquently put, communication is really critical. And it's we need to find innovative ways to communicate intraoperatively between surgeon and pathologist if, if this method is to work. Um, but there are a lot of practical considerations. Again, time out of the OR um, for the surgeon to walk to pathology. Right now, I think that we, uh, I hate to say occasionally, because I, I don't have a great sense for how often this actually happens, but I do think we try to walk things down to the frozen section lab currently to orient, to talk about the specimen itself, but there's a lot of challenges with that. It means leaving a patient on the table for a while. And I hate to say this, we're all operating back in 7, 13, 14, and oral surgery is even farther down in OR6. It's a little bit of a hike down to, to the frozen lab. Um, and so that's something to consider. Uh, the labor and time intensiveness of the actual frozen pathology, that is, 
nothing that needs to be underestimated. We recognize that that is a huge burden um, to, to think about. And then technology is really expensive. That was a really slick intraoperative video conference thing that they have at Mount Sinai, but also we also recognize that that's, that costs a lot of resources and time and, and frankly money to set that up. So that's not a simple thing to ask for as well. So one, one, we've talked a little bit about, or a lot of it about how do we evaluate margins? What are some of the data about the best way to evaluate the margins? But a bigger, another big question is, well, what's an adequate margin distance? And traditionally we have used five millimeters as what we would call negative margins. Anything less than that would be considered close and positive margins would be considered actually tumor at the inked edge. Um, but is that, is that accurate? Is five millimeters too much? Is it too little? Um, and again, we're talking when millimeters matter that much with regards to function, I think this is a valuable question to delve into. And lots of folks have attempted to answer this. The first couple of papers I'll talk about, um, we're actually proposing to redefine this and at frankly much smaller margins than we have traditionally used in the past. And so this was a retrospective study looking at 381 patients. Um, for of note, most of these margins, um, the specimens and the frozens were collected uh, from the specimen itself, excuse me, only 5% were collected from the tumor bed. And they used um, an analysis to calculate the local recurrence-free survival by margin status. And when they evaluated all of the margins, um, they found that 2.2 millimeters was sort of the uh, magical optimal cutoff value when you look at uh, local recurrence-free survival over several years. So obviously positive margins have a really poor prognosis. Um, anything greater than actually positive up to 2.2, slightly worse. And then between 2.3 and five and comparing greater than five, the outcomes are about the same for both groups. And so when they controlled for adjuvant therapy and tumor size, um, this is what they found, that these two groups are relatively similar. And what they also found is when adjusting for those other variables that the margin status was really the most significant when determining local recurrence-free survival. And so that's, I just highlight this to bring up the fact that how important margin status really is for a long-term recurrence-free survival and, and ultimately overall survival. So this is another paper. Uh, this is out of Iowa. The, the paper I just mentioned ago is out of MSK. And they, this is another retrospective review, admittedly downside on that data, but they looked at a total of 432 patients, a broad range of tumor sizes, um, and they specifically were looking at margins based on just uh, positive, less than one, and then one, two, three, four, and then greater than five. And what they found was that basically anything less than one this time, not even 2.2, just one millimeter, the uh, uh, local recurrence rate was substantially higher. But once you even got one millimeter away, your, your, uh, your recurrence rates went down quite substantially. Now, notably, all the frozen sections in this study were actually taken from the tumor bed itself, which I thought was interesting. Um, and this is, the, this is the nice graphic representation of their, I think this relative risk related to local recurrence rates, where obviously positive margin, very high risk, um, between zero and one, still fairly high risk. But once you get down to one millimeter, it's, it doesn't really change a whole lot between one and five which I think is pretty fascinating and, and very different than what we traditionally have thought of. And frankly, as a surgeon, it makes me just fairly uncomfortable to be, to be real, but um, something we definitely need to look at and consider why are these all the same and, and you know, should we be changing the way we think about this? Um, and this graphic is looking at uh, uh, for positive, for, sorry, if the margins were positive on permanent pathology, but the frozens were negative, it still has a higher local um, uh, recurrence rate. And that is almost certainly because it's fairly difficult to assess where those frozen section margins were really coming from in relationship to the tumor itself. Just going back a little bit um, to our discussion before about tumor bed margins versus specimen margin. This is a, a, a meta-analysis, which is stronger data. This was um, published in 2015 looking back at five separate studies and combining the data um, for a larger analysis. And this, 
this study really um, lends itself more to the five millimeters is the golden rule uh, idea. And they looked at relative risk reduction with margin based on 539 patients. Most of the studies, these four studies used five, milli milli uh, five millimeters as the cutoff for adequacy. Only one of them used 10 millimeters um, as their cutoff for uh, negative margins. But it was a little hard to compare close margins versus positive margins due to so many patients in that study received, uh, received adjuvant radiation. So it's difficult to make a comparison. Was it the radiation that was a factor there or was it more the margin status? But overall, their recurrence rates when the margins were greater than five millimeters was about 20.1% uh, with net for negative margins, which is consistent with a lot of the other uh, literature that we have seen. So this, you know, the, basically the point here is that there's a lot of controversy and there's not a very clear answer, um, but we still typically use five millimeters as our golden rule. And when they uh, analyzed, this is the same study, when they analyzed all of their data, they found a total risk reduction of about 21% uh, between five millimeters, um, less than five millimeters and greater than five millimeters. So um, what are some other factors here. You know, why is it that some tumors you can get a two millimeter margin and the tumor doesn't come back and other cancers you can have completely negative margins greater than five millimeters and the tumor comes back. So there, clearly there's something else at play. It's obviously not just about margin status and, and you all know that. So we're looking at, you know, aggressive patterns of disease, um, worse pattern of invasion, and this is a slide uh, that I stole from Dr. Uh, Brandywine about just looking at, well, if the tumor, you know, the tumor look aggressive, does it have skip lesions? Is it more invasive, lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion? Um, and that may be difficult to, to specifically analyze in some of these other studies. So we all know that, but it's difficult to put a, a finger on exactly what it is. And it's, it's reasonable that we need to at least take these other um, uh, uh, disease factors into consideration when we're looking at margin status. And then the other issue for adjuvant treatment considerations, we obviously are looking at the stage, adverse features, and then presence of nodal disease, which I haven't talked about a whole lot, but clearly plays a big role in um, adjuvant therapy. And with the time I have left, I did, I know this is a, a busy slide, um, but I did just want to touch on a little bit about how the pathology um, really does impact adjuvant treatment. And so this is for early oral cavity cancer, so T1, T2, and it, it's a lot, but I'll try to break it down a little bit. So um, patients that uh, typically would get surgery, there is an arm for definitive radiotherapy, although that is not considered first-line therapy, as mentioned earlier. If there are no positive nodes and no adverse features, we just follow those, no adjuvant therapy is given. One positive no without adverse features, we usually consider radiotherapy, and it has been my experience that if patients have neck mets, they're almost always getting radiation. Um, and so that it says consider, but I think most radiation oncologists would be nervous about continuing to monitor that. And then any adverse features, depending on what they are, will buy you at least radiation at minimum and oftentimes systemic chemotherapy, depending on patient selection. So any extra, extra capsular extension and or a positive margin, a positive margin in and of itself, um, consider systemic chemotherapy. And then any other features, you can consider radiation therapy alone or possible combo therapy. And I'll tell you, as, as those of you sat in our head and neck tumor board, a lot of the, sometimes our conversations go around, well, what do we consider a positive margin? Are the margins cleared? Um, you know, because it, it greatly impacts whether or not someone's going to require chemotherapy on top of um, higher dose radiation. And usually they turn around and look at us surgeons and go, well, what do you think? Do you think it's clear? Do you think it's not clear? And that's, sometimes that's really hard for us to answer. Um, this is for more aggressive tumors. So T3, um, T4A, and then any uh, nodal disease, obviously we're performing typically would prefer surgery first if patient's a good candidate. Um, no adverse features, it's simply because they're a T3, T4, they definitely get chemotherapy or, or sorry, just radiation. And then adverse features, typically we're adding on systemic therapy on top of radiation as well. Um, and then considering re-resection if there's positive margins, which is oftentimes very challenging. 
So some take home points, um, I just wanted just to summarize. This area is very challenging. Um, it's challenging from a surgical standpoint, challenging from a pathologic standpoint. Um, the anatomy is complicated uh, and it's a really, um, from a quality of life patient outcome standpoint, a very high stakes real estate area. All of the things that we do are going to greatly impact um, that patient's quality of life in the future. Secondly, intraoperative margin evaluation is, you know, ideally would be done off the main specimen, but there are a lot of challenges with that approach um, that uh, need to be discussed, talked about, um, and delve into different strategies that we can use. Margin distance in and of itself is a bit controversial, but the traditional five millimeters is what we use here. Um, and it does depend on the study that you're looking at. And more importantly, other factors may really supersede margin status for certain tumors um, when it comes to local recurrence down the line. And finally, communication is absolutely paramount uh, for thorough and accurate margin assessment, which we all know, but is um, sometimes easier said than done. And with that, I want to say thank you. You might recognize, or uh, probably not, these are some of the folks in the OR. These are some of our fantastic OR nurses who are calling y'all from the OR asking about path on frozen section status and all, but I just wanted to see their faces so that you know who you're talking to. And then here's a picture of um, maybe my future surgeon, I don't know, uh, my daughter. <laughs> and at that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, um, anything y'all might wanna talk about. And I'll stop sharing my screen here. Great, thank you so much for that. Very informative and um, very clearly presented as a non-clinician. Um, I even got, or I think I got what you were saying, um, really highlighting some of the uh, potential pitfalls and caveats in communication. You do have one question in the chat to get us started. Pons, would you like to uh, unmute or do you want me to read it? You can read it if you want. Okay, perfect. So the question is, is there a difference in recurrence rate following adju adjuvant therapy based on mutational types in these tumors? Hmm. And do targeted therapies improve in combination with radiation? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I, I, that probably better for the radiation oncologist, but yes, my understanding is that, uh, different mutations, different, um, uh, genetic abnormalities do make certain tumors more sensitive, more or less sensitive to radiation, I should say. And we typically, I mean, we don't usually test for those sort of things, but for recurrences or, um, you know, when patients have already had radiation and considering systemic therapy, we're certainly looking at that, but there are definitely differences in recurrence rate. I think it's an area that is under much heavier study now than it ever has been in the past. Now that we have a lot more access to testing. Um, and, and you, every conference we go to, we we're, we're there's someone's presenting the new data on the, the genetic, um, abnormalities that are associated with worse, worse prognosis. Um, and then targeted therapies improve in combination with radiation. Typically, well, that's, again, that would probably be better for Dr. Nobel to answer. She's our medical oncologist. Um, but usually they're using traditional cisplatin. Um, occasionally uh, they used tetuximab in the past, but that has fallen out of favor. I think it hasn't been shown to be as effective as traditional cisplatin. And then we don't usually use um, Keytruda up front, pantitumab, but... Um, that has been used in the uh, usually more of a palliative or salvage setting. But, what about Erbutex, EGFR targeting? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. That's for smarter people than I. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brucey, for a very interesting uh, and informative talk. And, and very practical. Uh, yesterday we had a frozen section. Both of us, we were struggling exactly how we are gonna submit the margins and, and, and uh, these are issues we struggle with it uh, every day. Uh, most of the classical writing on depths of invasion and uh, uh, to some extent uh, the margin status is done on uh, the final report on uh, paraffin embedded section. And there are two reasons uh, why this is done. And that is because frozen section is fraught with artifacts. Mm -hmm. And also the tissue expand um, when you freeze the specimen uh, 
you you give it gives a a larger uh, distance than usual actually, while formalin actually shrinks specimens between uh, ten in to to twenty percent depending on the on the tissue. So um, I think there is a lot of uh, opportunity for improvement in this and also data-driven decisions rather than impression of experts. I think in, in our, um, at least in the department here, uh, most of the thing that we have done is patient-based sampling. And the pathologists are not involved very much because there are a lot of variation amongst us. We are not all of us head and neck expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, why not to leave everything for the permanent? Why do we have to assess uh, margins and depths of invasion on table, especially if it's, uh, it takes a lot of time? And the reimbursement in particular for a pathologist sitting there assessing uh, a margin is not actually worse. So since everything is driven in the healthcare by reimbursement, I think this is one of the issues that is need to be discussed frankly about it. And, and um, I'd like to see your intake about this. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a great question because you're absolutely right. We, we hang our hat on the permanent margins, right? Uh, most of the time, at least I know I do. That's what I'm looking at. If I got a positive margin on that first cutout on that first resection, that's, that's a big hit. I do think though frozen are valuable, the data does suggest if you can go clear those margins, even off the patient, but you have an accurate idea of exactly where it came from, that's a little, that's more um, accurate than say just the, the, the tumor-based specimen. And those recurrence rates are lower. And one of those papers that I, I showed did, did illustrate that, that if you can go back and clear them at the time of, you have a better chance of, of um, low or sorry a lower chance of recurrence in the future uh and the other issue is too that i mentioned all the reconstructive things coming back and taking additional margins later is about nearly impossible um part in part if we do a big reconstruction it's buried underneath a free flap you're never going to get there again even if we don't though this was just the amount of scarring and everything that occurs it's it's unlike a i would say a skin margin that is a lot easier to come back and resect because things don't change a whole lot. Or if they do, it's minimal. You can find where you're coming from or you can figure out where it came from. In the oral cavity, it's, I would, I would almost never say I feel comfortable being like, oh yeah, we went back and cleared it. Cause you just, I just don't um, know. That's regarding the depths, the depths of invasion in particular, maybe also uh, uh, status of the margin. Why not to use the new new technologies like uh, you know a micro um, CTs and you know some kind of tomography where you could see you know uh, depths close, especially for the tongue, you know, which well, you can you can invent yeah. a device that you can assess actually depths and and easy. T tell me one more. Um, CT is tough. Uh, you know, right now, most of our preoperative imaging modality is a combination of CT or PET. We rarely are able to get MRI. And a lot of people, if they've had any dental work, you can't even see the tumor on CT scan ahead of time. And so it's really there hard are, for... Um, there are MRI now and, and uh, CT for mice. Uh, you know, you can, you can use those and put the tongue in and <laughs> assist <laughs> The good news is that is I don't think this um, counts as a public venue, so I think the intellectual property is still protected. So I might not be able to post it on YouTube anymore, though. <laughs> you know, but for me, well, I, I only really need to know depth of invasion intraoperatively on a frozen if I am not sure. Usually those are just always early stage cancers, and I'm not sure if we're going to have to do a neck dissection at the same time. That's, for me, the only time that I'm like, I need, I really would like to know because sometimes I'll counsel the patient, listen, if the, if the pathologist comes back and says depth of invasion is, you know, four millimeters, five millimeters, we're going to do your neck right now. Um, and other than that, though, like on these big cancer resections, it, that's not very critical because we can already stage it appropriately preoperatively. We don't need to know that kind of information. So it just depends on the clinical scenario. But that's why we want to, you know, am I going to do this neck dissection? Not uh, are we going to stage it? 
um, there's there's a, a couple of different factors there. And you you know you might argue, well, why don't you stage everybody? And and some people don't want to go back to that. Oh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why staging surgery is tough. Uh, but that's in my opinion the main the main instance where that is really clinically helpful in the OR. Thank you. I think we I still have, have time for more questions, about, Diana. Do, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, hey, Diana. I'm, hey, so you'll see my name coming up pretty frequently because I'm signing out head and neck. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about that form you had with the pictures. We yeah. do like that idea. We just need to go through the forms committee to be official. So who do you envision would be actually drawing out on that form the picture of what this uh, me. I, I, I would envision the attending surgeon would scrub out, which, you know, scrubbing out and scrubbing back in is not a big deal. It's the, it's the walking and the, the leaving. Um, but I would envision us filling out that form at the time of the operation, drawing exactly where the tumor came from, writing down, you know, this is how I oriented it. This is where long stitch is or whatever other concoction we, we come up with to tell y'all what is what. Um, and then in, in, in really complicated cases, I do think it's still appropriate to, to walk down and have a conversation with somebody, but that's how I would envision that going. And that could be for both permanent path and frozen. And we could, you know, that, that would be a great idea trying to incorporate something like that. Um, so that it's even more clear in the gross room. Cause what, what Dr. Laura, Dr. Gonzalez had said was that sometimes the specimen will get to the gross room and it's, you know, very unclear exactly where things came from. Um, and I understand that maybe this would help make it a more clear picture. I like that idea. We're also hoping, we don't have this now, but to have a pathologist assistant there in the frozen room. Mm. So after the frozen, it's direct handoff in person to minimize risk of errors. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Very productive grand rounds. It's great to hear this crosstalk between the departments and something we don't always have. So it's very, uh, very good to get this accomplished. Thank you. And we do still have time for um, one more question or so if there's any others. And if not, please um, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Buchek for the wonderful talk. Okay. And please remember to send those recommendations for speakers for the fall. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you thank again. Thank you everyone. Anne.